Just making sure everything seems to be up and running. All right, everybody. So excited. Uh, thank you so much for joining East Oaks today. We are super fortunate to uh, be able to have an interview with Grace DeVito. Uh, Grace DeVito is going to be coming down to teach a live stream talk, uh, which is called The Organic Still Life. And it will be on May 24th through the 26th. Uh, we also are going to be doing, uh, for all of our subscribers, I'll be doing another open critique night on the 17th. This is free to all the subscribers that are a part of our platform. Just submit some of your work and ask one or two questions. And what we're going to do is we'll select a few of them and I will go over and do a critique. But without further ado, I wanted to just jump right in to uh, this introduction. Grace DeVito has been doing uh, art her entire life and she's been creative her entire life. And uh, she is well versed in realistic portraiture, figurative work and still life uh, as part of her genres. Uh, she's a Connecticut native. She studied at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, majoring and then pursuing a career in illustration. So Grace, so excited about having you on the uh, on our interview. Thanks, Lewis. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Excited about the upcoming workshop. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It really is. I tell you, um, we are, you know, we have like a little uh, guest space. And part of what we do here is we we just we love having new people come in. It's a whole sort of cross pollination of new ideas, seeing people's new approaches. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to enjoy hanging out with you. And uh, I tell you, I, I know that it's going to be a real treat for all of our subscribers. So make sure all for all of you who subscribe, subscribe to our um, platform, you can ask her and do there's a chat so you can ask her any questions live while she's teaching the workshop. And then it's recorded for uh, at your leisure. You can go back and watch it at any given time. But if y'all haven't uh, seen her Cotton Still Lives, you need to, we, as we have like here in the background, you need to go and look at her still lives. They're just as stunning as her portraits. So, um, so Grace, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, I don't know a deep amount of your history and it seems like you've had a couple of chapters of your life as far as your creative career. So um, I would love to hear more about uh, how you got started, what got you into it, who was your like influence, if it was somebody or if it was something um, that you discovered about yourself. Um, well, um, I always enjoyed drawing as a child and uh, particularly I was drawn to um, Norman Rockwell, N.C. Wyeth, those kind of mm. artists. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't grow up in an atmosphere thinking that you could make a living as a fine artist. So, mm -hmm. you know, the only sort of, the only real direction I thought about was doing work commercially. Mm -hmm. So in school, um, um, I pursued uh, college in going to a, uh, an art school, not necessarily a college say, but an art school. And, um, my first year was at Philadelphia College of Art and then I switched to a uh, school of visual arts in New York City where I majored in illustration. And the thing that was really great about the school of visual arts was they didn't have um, full-time teachers. They had professionals who would teach a class or two a week. So some of my teachers were like the big thing in in, in the illustration world, it was um, Marvin Madelson um, at the time, um, Michael Dees, Brawl Brawls. Um, the, the, they were big names in illustration in the 19th. Mm. Um, so uh, 
So I went to school there. The, I will say this, the one problem I think a lot of art schools had at that time is they were not teaching really paint raw. It was all about the idea and the concept. And while there might have been a few Rex, make sure you step just a little closer. I'm getting someone saying they can heart they can't hear you as well. And I've I've upped your volume just a touch. Okay. So sorry to okay. um interrupt you. Okay. Um is that that's better? perfect. Yeah, it's much better. So um a lot of what was taught was all about the concept and you know the idea was king and the execution was you figure it out, you know, be an artist, do whatever. And I think I always struggled with feeling confident in my ability to draw. And mm. so graduated, put a portfolio together to work commercially and did that for, you know, I guess probably about 10 years or so freelance. Um, and, and during that time, I also got married and had uh, two children and I always um, say it was a great great business to be in if you were if you had a family because I could always work around their schedule it was tough for me mm. at that time you know illustration was very a very deadline uh, oriented business so a lot of times I would be working you know in the middle of the night and uh, during the day you know uh, mm. I would literally sometimes have you know my child in a you know with baby Bjorn and stuff. <laughs> but you know it all got done but um, I, I just felt I needed more training and um, mm. didn't really know where to go at that time because it was still um, you know the 90s at that point and things were just starting to turn around grand central academy was mm -hmm. starting or water street i guess but i didn't know about that for for quite a while yet and i found um that i i, I realized that I, I needed to draw better and i saw a dan green workshop uh, he was advertising at his home studio, which wasn't that far, too far from where I live. And I I went just for his open demo the night before the workshop would start because I literally had a, a, an infant, a new baby at home. And I saw that his wife was teaching um, a, a drawing class in, or now in, in my school and um, I couldn't do it at the time, but I, I saved it. And then about two years later, I signed up for it. And um, while I didn't actually do the whole program with Wendy, because I wasn't a pastelist and I really didn't, um, it wasn't the medium I was most comfortable with. Um, mm. was wonderful, wonderful teacher. and. But I saw another person um, had work at the school and her name was Laurel Bach. So I switched into her class, which was oil painting. And I started uh, studying uh, with her and painting from the live model. And it, it was a, a great experience. And I really kind of learned to paint. And she had learned um, from a teacher named John Murray who was a student of Frank Riley's. Um, hmm. He was. A, I've I've heard of Frank Riley, but I can't place his work. Uh, well, he he. I think he's mostly known as a really now as a teacher. Oh, of, okay. Of uh, famous illustrators, and and he taught at the Art Students League. And oh, okay. Illustrators would go there to learn, and he had kind of had a system. In fact. Jacob Collins was um, studied his work, I think, mm. over kind of the, the way he taught and things, um, things, you know, the good way to do them. Mm. And it was kind of academic, but really condensed, I think. So 
Um, and I was familiar with that way of, of working. So when I met Laurel, who had that background, it just really kind of clicked. Mm. And so I studied with her for a number of years and eventually started phasing out doing commercial illustration. And uh, I thought at the time, well, what, what really would move me more? And I thought that would be portraiture. And so I went in that direction, started doing commercial commissions. Mm. But um, in the meantime, in between, once that started moving along and I was getting more commissions, during my downtime, I started doing still lives just as a way for myself to to learn to uh, experiment and where I didn't feel comfortable doing that with a paid commission. So, mm -hmm. And it, as it turned out, I really, really enjoyed doing the still lives. Mm. I started doing uh, in between, you know, I do a commission, do a still life, do a commission, do a still life. And just kind of started building up a body of work there. Um, so. Wow. So um, you, one thing I'm going to go back to uh, is you being, I think I, I hear this a lot lately uh, and it's not, I think it's something that's always been around. So, but one of the harder things for female artists is the juggling of having a family and trying to run, you know, run a household as well as paint. And uh, it was, it was nice to hear that in one sense that having the flexible schedule was really good for you. But, um, you know, I know that there's quite a few challenges that come with that. Like you said, you had, you had them, you know, literally in like a papoose on your front <laughs> to while you're painting. Um, so I think a lot of our, at least our female audience would like to know um, what it was like to navigate. And it sounds to me like the deadlines that you had for yourself was helpful in the sense to hold you accountable because I feel like the accountability of holding yourself to do work that's not, does not have deadlines um, would be tough. Well, deadlines, it, it definitely held you accountable and it was, uh, so I guess it was a curse and a blessing at the same time mm. forced to work, but it was, it was difficult. Um, I think anybody who has children uh, knows that you're always, um, you make sacrifices. I mean, I uh, most of the young mothers that I would meet in you know, going, taking kids to uh, little play groups and things like that weren't working, and I always had to build my schedule around my children's um, nap time and things mm -hmm. like that. I never got the break when they were mm -hmm. right. <laughs> could build in, I could, during the course of a, of a normal day, you know, from getting up to going, uh, you know, a normal sleep time, I could probably fit in like five or six hours of work, mm. you know, between a nap and or then when they were in school, but uh, even longer stretches. But, um, but then when there would be a deadline, I'd have to do all that. And then at, um, you know, when they would go to bed, then it then I have to put in a lot more hours. So it was tiring, but um, you know, you get a couple of days off. So it was kind of a feast or famine kind of. Mm. You could have a crazy few weeks, and then uh, you wouldn't have a anything to work on for another week or two or or so. So it was up and down, but I think. Um, I think it's like that, you know, in any, any industry, of, if, if a mom is mm -hmm. like a caretaker, um, I think have gotten better, um, with uh, the internet and everything, uh, for that. But, um, and I think you see a lot more fathers helping out, which is mm -hmm. great. I know a lot of, um, professional artists who dads, are the primary caregivers and their wives. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you make it work one way or the other. 
I think of uh, Greg Mortensen when I think of that because he he and his wife basically tag team. They she works sort of a day job and he takes care of the kids during the day, and then he does the night shift where he paints in the evenings when they're like asleep, you mm -hmm. know. So like they do like a you know alteration. Uh, so I guess for that last question on on that uh, front, what would be that like? If you if something comes to mind, what would be like the biggest advice that you would give for uh, for women who want to make this a successful career uh, that are either young mothers or are trying to launch their careers? What would be like one or two things that come to mind that has seemed to either benefit you or hindsight's twenty twenty for you? Um, I would say I would give this amount of uh, this bit of information um when i first met my husband he was in advertising and he always used to say if anything can stop you it will if you mm. let it and mm -hmm. i took that to heart and i think you have to make it a priority mm -hmm. um, put the time into paint it means yeah you're not going to be able to maybe do you know, some social things, um, right. especially, you know, because your time is, is limited, but, mm -hmm. and so you can't put in a full, you know, eight hours or 10 hours. Okay. Well, figure out what you can do realistically and then, and then stick to it, but, you know, make it a priority work, make other aspects of your life. Work. Mm. Right. Ever. I always would have work would come first it, obviously the children they're mm -hmm. of course but other than that it was if i had work to do the work came first mm -hmm. and everything else would be later so i'm more of a morning person so i would start early and you know if i had to any appointments i would do them you know as late in the afternoon as possible so it wouldn't conflict and i still do that Mm -hmm. Well, it's why people think when you work at home, you have so much more free time. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're always thinking about about it. And, um, you know, when I, I could work all day in the studio and then in the evening, it's like, oh, I have to do paperwork and answer emails. So it's like never ending. It really isn't. And that that's great segue for another question that I think a lot of people would like to know, which is um, what kind of routine, because I believe that most artists that are successful have a bit of a routine or at least try to adhere to some sort of discipline. What kind of routine do you have a day that you feel like sets yourself up for the most success? Um, well, I, I kind of do the same things every day uh, in the morning. I just, you know, get up. I usually exercise first. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I uh, try to be in the studio by uh, nine o'clock. Uh, and I have, um, I'm lucky enough now um, for the, the past uh, eight years or so, I have my own separate building. It was um, a garage that was converted. So I have about 550 square feet uh, all to myself. And so I just, the commute is short. I leave the house. I walk. 50 feet and then I'm in my own little world and I just start starting right away um, uh, I kind of I don't really believe in inspiration mm -hmm. you know there are days you just don't feel like it but you still have to you know to get things done so I just start my routine I get my palette ready at first that kind of warms me up you know putting out a fresh paint or um, taking off old paint that's, you know, getting a little crusty. So, um, and then I just start in and I kind of just work uh, till I have a lunch break, maybe around one. Mm -hmm. I'll take uh, maybe 45 minutes or so. And then I'll come back and work until about five-ish o'clock in the winter, maybe a little uh, shorter if the lights not 
great, but I have mm-hmm. that. So, but I'm not really, I'm not working at night anymore, really. Yeah. <laughs> How, or do you mainly work only from natural light? Um, no, I, I, I do have natural light, but sometimes mm-hmm. Northeast, the light just isn't strong enough. I yeah, think. that's so true. I back up um, uh, daylight fluorescence that mm-hmm. I can, and then sometimes, um, even then I'll have uh, the spiral fluorescence uh, floodlight. Mm-hmm. I need more light on my um, um, on the reference that I'm working from, mm-hmm. and, and you know, as as a uh, a portrait painter, I'm working from photos mostly. I try to, if I'm working on an adult portrait um, commission, I will paint a study of the um, the subject. Uh, if they're over a certain age, you know, I can mm-hmm. do. I'm not like I haven't mastered painting young children from life yet, like Lewis. But yeah, I know. I is I have not mastered it for sure. Every time I have another child, I realize, oh my gosh, this is the this is the hard like one of the hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> you know, is you know learning how to like work with them and, and while they're shifting. But and I only do that for a particular age. I can't pass us uh, younger than six. I will not. I can't. I just can't do oh, it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's yeah. hard. I'm some children. It's hard enough to photograph them. Oh, I mean, to get that split second, it might take a hundred photos of a young one. You know, before we find something that works. I usually take anywhere from like five hundred is my lowest. <laughs> yeah. I just put the camera on, you know, clicking away, but, um, but. Um, when I work uh, doing still lives, I, it's always from live. And I do paint, um, and I have painted uh, with a group, and uh, we, we paint the figure from mm-hmm. COVID did, you know, put an end to that for a while, but I'm, we're back to painting again. And, uh, but the still lives are always from live. And mm-hmm. so, uh, well, and I think that that also brings up a great point, which is, um, I would think that that is probably what you use um, to continue to keep your, your interpretation of the photo, uh, sort of your skills sharp is your, your life practices that you're working on with still life and figure. Would you say that that is what you use as, as your practices? Absolutely. Absolutely. As I had uh, mentioned before, I use um, I use the still life to experiment really um, to increase my abilities because mm-hmm. I it, it feels though I don't have um, a client mm-hmm. you know, have certain needs to be filled it's all really I'm the director so it's just my you know, I have to fulfill my own needs. So. Mm. Um, so it, it really did allow me to learn a lot hmm. and it does help in interpreting because I know what the photo is, uh, is going to be lacking as mm-hmm. so when I, when I do set up my still life, I always photograph it too. So I can just, um, I'll put it in Photoshop. I'll I'll posterize it. Just want it to work on the design. So mm-hmm. when you mm-hmm. the difference and you lose the subtlety, the, the camera isn't really there yet. It's it's not seeing like the eye. Although I mean, it gets better all the time. So. It's it's yeah. I, I tell people we've we've got a lot better technology today, but it still doesn't exceed life. But um, you know it. I will say there's more information now than there's ever been. So I agree with you. Um, How long we've been doing um, commissions, but when I started doing portrait commissions, digital cameras were just oh yeah when had them, and it, when I we travel to a location to photograph uh, the subject, and you would have to take your film to be. Mm-hmm developed and see before you left town, see if you 
you know, if you didn't screw it up or something. So if you got anything decent to work from. I was with uh, my little, I had little nieces I was with this past week and she was showing me like old pictures of family. And mm -hmm. she asked me, goes, why do all these pictures look weird? They don't like have like the, why they don't, don't have like color, you know, just talk about the color. And I was like, well, it used to be that you had to like take a picture and you didn't get to see it. And you had to take it to a shop and wait a day or two and then go back to the shop and then pick up your photos before you see them, you know? And she's like, what? It was just so great. It was one of those moments. <laughs> oh, in the iPhone world. But um, one of the other questions that uh, I wanted to ask is what is, um, how did you transition from illustration to being a commissioned portrait painter or a portrait painter? And what was it like and what did you change in your, in your business approach? Um, I think a lot of people would enjoy knowing how you got started. Um, with illustration, I started out uh, first kind of just pounding the pavement as they, as it was termed in those days where you'd have a portfolio, you'd drop it off, all the, the book publishers, magazines, ad agencies in, in New York City. So I'm, uh, I live about 30 miles outside of the city. Uh, I would go in and I drop off a portfolio. Um, they had an open uh, call day usually for maybe uh, one week a month. But so I would drop it off, drop off a portfolio. Um, actually, I have a couple of them and just go in, drop them off. Then I get, um, fully, fingers crossed, you get a job. Um, eventually, uh, I started working with. Uh, representatives and I had uh, worked with Bernstein and Andrew Lee. Mm. Um, um, they weren't the first I was with, uh, but I was with them the longest. And much like um, uh, portrait brokers today, it was kind of the same thing. They they represented a group of artists and they had the contacts. In various magazines and agencies and things like that. So, and they were mm -hmm. for, um, for their services, but it worked out better for me because um, I had children, you know, and, and then I didn't have to do, it, it gave me more time to paint. Sure. Uh, then when I started studying um, and really what I think is actually learning how to paint um, later with uh, Laurel, um, I put to, I kind of did the same thing. I put together a portfolio of uh, samples of uh, portraits about, uh, I, I worked up to what I thought were 10 good portraits. And um, I started going to the portraits and mm -hmm. portrait brokers. A couple of, uh, there were a couple of them around at the time. And uh, eventually got represented that way. Um, transitioning from doing commercial work to doing portrait work was, wasn't very difficult. In fact, it was actually easier for me because it took mm -hmm. longer. Um, mm -hmm. Used to. At the same time, most of the illustration work I was doing wasn't really large paintings. I think probably maybe the biggest I ever really did was um, maybe uh, you know twenty by thirty would have been big. Mm -hmm. You know, my book covers were being made uh, small, so um, so that part wasn't difficult, uh, but doing portraits that were bigger and more complicated, so it was taking me longer, but I still had more time, which was good because I could work longer on them, and if I wanted to, you know, um, change something, fix it, well, I had, I had the ability to do that. Mm. 
And from a business point of view, um, it really wasn't that different because I went from having a, a representative in the commercial world to a representative in the fine art world. Yeah. And honestly, like you're saying, um, it's, it was probably better for your scenario, just because it allowed for you more time, you know, people, I don't think realize how much time marketing and emails and advertisement trying to do all the other business sides of things with communicating with the clients, um, that it takes to, to, you know, develop the network. And, uh, it sounds like in your, in your case that that's was very advantageous which is really great because there's so many roads that lead to Rome, right? Um, as far as making it a career and you've got to find out what, what maximizes, um, your values, you know, and how you want to, uh, push forward. So, so that's really some good advice. What would you say has been some of like the aha moments of, of your, life that you felt like took your work to the next level. Um, do you feel like there's been like a few chapters or a few paintings where you go, Oh my gosh, I discovered this thing. And, um, that was really powerful for my next stage of painting. Um, yeah, so definitely have been aha moments. Um, like I said, since I wasn't trained academically, so I didn't have, um, you know, four years at um, uh, Water Street or um, Grand Central Atelier. But I later did take courses there. And mm. Got that kind of uh, experience. Um, so a lot of the things that I was learning through um, Laurel Bach, uh, I would go back to my studio and try them out. But a lot of it, uh, I was also doing a lot of self teaching and mm -hmm. looking at, uh, you know, master's work and making copies and trying to figure out, you know, how they did something. And uh, so there were some aha moments there mm -hmm. to uh, particularly uh, certain painters I realized, oh, they really, like, this painting they did, I really only needed to use four colors. You know, I didn't have yeah. So there were those kind of moments. Um, I think when, I, I never really understood about glazing and scumbling. I didn't really understand. I kind of was painting very directly. At mm -hmm. the, and then when I started um, learning about it, I didn't really get it. And then one of the things I learned about painting, overpainting, indirect painting, and, and refining things, was putting a couch on the, the dry surface and then working over that. Oh, that makes a really big difference. Because mm -hmm. I didn't know that, you know, you if you don't have that, it always came out kind of scratchy. You can never get things to sort of meld together. Mm -hmm. Patchy. Um, so that was another a big aha moment. Um, Do you use any particular medium when you're glazing? Uh, I have used a lot of things over the years and I don't know that I would say there's any one particular thing that I think is the best, mm -hmm. but I try to, um, well, currently, I'll, I'll say what I'm currently. <laughs> so, um, I like to use um, just a, a, as little medium as possible in the beginning of a painting. Um, uh, and so when I'm blocking something in, I will use Gamsol and uh, sometimes um, I'll use a medium. It's a mixture of Galkid one part galkid to one part um, uh, linseed stand oil and five parts uh, gamsol. And that kind of helps set the paint up quickly. And, it'll, mm -hmm. and after I kind of get the initial 
wash in or block in, then I, I don't want to use any mediums. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, first layer has as much paint in it as possible. And then once that dries, when I, if I want to refine something, I will use um, either uh, the, um, what's it, Rublev's. Oleo gel? Oleo gel, I'll use that. Sometimes, too, um, if it, the paint has, if I already started with a gal kit and it's dry to the touch uh, or, you know, dry for a few days, I'll just use the uh, gal kit gel and rub that over if I need something to dry pretty quickly. But I try to not use too much of the medium. I mean, mm -hmm. wipe off as much as I can because I don't want I don't want it to um, affect the paint and, and the adhesion and all that. And I don't mm -hmm. want to load. I've never had um, a painting um, that a commission. I've never had anything come back yet. I mean, I haven't been doing you know that long. I would think it would probably take a, a long time. Although um, I did paint over a, a, a surface that I had painted uh, um, a, what, what did I use? Um, I think I just used some white paint and I painted over an old painting. And I mm -hmm. used, um, I think a mixture of, of linseed oil and Gamsol mm -hmm. and painted over that and, and the paint on top of that very quickly uh, shrunk and cracked. And it's the only time wow. it happened but I think it was because the surface of the, the um, paint over that I did was a little too shiny. You know? mm. uh, I probably should have sanded it a little bit first, so it just didn't have the grip. Right. But I haven't really had any problems, so. Yeah. Wow, that's that's awesome. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, Vimala uh, said, that I've seen Grace's paintings on her website and that those are so beautiful. Thank you, Vamal. There's several people who have come in, said where they're from and said hello, that they're watching. Um, so everyone make sure if y'all have any questions for Grace that you're welcome to, uh, to ask any questions or advice while she's here uh, so that uh, we can maximize this opportunity with such a wonderful painter. But uh, so one of uh, what is, let's see, you were saying earlier that you actually uh, had a friend, I had Charlie Mosto on a while back and his wife who are just lovely and they're helping uh, save it Howard, uh, save it Howard's uh, huge World War One pro project and that you actually had a connection there. Uh, yes, when my first year of art school was at Philadelphia College of Art, um, later it was uh, renamed to the University of the Arts, um, and Sabin was in my uh, my class. We were in the same group together for our foundation year, so we had all our classes together. And he was, uh, even at that time, I mean, I, I just knew he was going to be, if anybody was going to do well, it was going to be Sabin. Wow. A terrific painter um, drawing. Uh, now, have you kept up with him at all over the years, or is this like all of a sudden he's resurfaced in in sort of your radar due to what he's working on? You need to reach out to him. We did lose touch, and then mm -hmm. um, a number of years ago, you know, before the World War uh, One monument, I did see his work in New York at. Um, what's in Columbus Circle, and, and so I heard, I, you know, heard about it, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the same guy I went to school with, and I think I may have looked him up, you know, on Facebook and sent him some messages, but other than that, you know, that. Gotcha. But I remember him being a wonderful, wonderful artist, even early on, really. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. I'm going to be on the front row when that thing gets revealed because of uh, just all the friends that were involved with it and how beautiful it is. It's just going to be so stunning. Um, Lizzie, 
Lizzie actually brought asked a question. How many hours a day do you actually spend painting? Thanks for your time. Um, well, uh, probably, uh, I would say uh, generally six to eight hours of actual painting time. And then in the evening, uh, I will, uh, you know, catch up on emails and, and do you know, businessy stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of feel like, um, I think painting is, is really taxing and and physically. Oh, yeah. Um, I wonder, I think probably more mentally. So mm -hmm. I see things that I don't have to do too much, you know, for evening. Although I probably messed up a number of emails. I have, I definitely have <laughs> to read times before I <laughs> Um, and it's funny you say that because I was talking with, uh, when we had Susan Lyon here, we were talking and she said, because of the same reasons, and I don't think people who don't paint really understand how mentally taxing it can be. And by the end of the day, you just don't want to even make decisions. Oh, yeah. Uh, but she was, she was saying, um, that she probably at max, like is her peak is to do five hours mm -hmm. and you know because at any point after that point she's so concentrated on focus that she's just exhausted she just can't even um work any further than that after five hours because it's just so uh tough to keep all the you know the balls in the air of you know value and color and drawing and you know painting and um and so I mean, I hear, her, you know, it's, it's tough. So. Yeah. There's definitely a point of diminishing returns. So <laughs> I'm really screwed up and uh, I better stop now before I <laughs> work. You know? and, and that's usually the time to quit. But I will say yeah. I, I work on Saturdays a lot, mm -hmm. uh, Sundays too. I'll, I'll put in, um, you know, a few hours. I generally, generally by two o'clock on the weekends, I'll stop. I try to take one day off a week, but I, my kids are grown now. So, um, yeah, really do that. But I mean, there are other things in your life that you tend to, but I really, um, have to say I've made, uh, I really love painting. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really feel like a chore. So. So. That's true. That's true. I mean, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, this is the one to do it. And, um, and that's the idea is to, in one sense, never work a day in your life. Um, and I also agree with you earlier, what you're saying that sometimes you're not inspired. Sometimes mm -hmm. you, you have to force yourself in there to get started. I think that it's usually the hardest part of that is getting started right where, once you're about an hour in, you're like, oh, no, I, I'm, you're in like the flow and you're like, oh, no, this is great. You know, and then there's some days where you just want to break your brushes and you yeah. know, that's that's there, too. Um, let's see. We have. Um, Ali Zarin, I think is how you say it. I apologize if I miss um, the question. I would love to hear you discuss your color palette and talk about edge work and value structure. Um, well, uh, I use uh, a palette. I try to keep my colors limited, but sometimes that limit can expand. And mm -hmm. uh, But I tend to go, always go back to a lot of the same colors. So normally, um, I have titanium white on my palette, and I also have uh, a, a lead white, either flake white or cremnitz white. Um, I tend to use the the lead white more in the shadows. Uh, I want to keep something, something like too um, too light, too fast, too low. Mm. and uh, also if, uh, if you know. If you're making a subtle change in um, the value of a color, you just like, oh, I just need a little bit lighter. Sometimes 
the titanium, if you just use a little hit of it, it's just a little too much and you jump too mm -hmm. quick. Sometimes uh, that is a great place to use lead white. So, uh, and then I have, um, I'll have a light yellow, usually cadmium yellow, pale, um, mm -hmm. and then yellow ochre. Sometimes I'll have um, transparent oxide yellow on the palette. Not always, but sometimes. Uh, and, and likewise with raw umber, sometimes I'll have that on or not. Lately, not as much. I'll just mix mm -hmm. up my own from then. Uh oh, we might have lost Grace. Grace, you there? Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, you just you stuttered. You stuttered for half a second, so I don't know if oh. it might have been your your connection. You're, you're breaking up. I can see you're uh, you're pretty pixelated. So I hope this will uh, stay. But um, so I was. I think I was at cadmium red light, alizarin crimson ultramarine blue, ivory black, and viridian. And that's mm -hmm. so. That's great. Well, this will be the last question that we'll, we'll ask uh, for, for today, Consider we're almost up out of time. So say, good morning, guys. Beautiful work, Grace. What would your advice for your brand, your, your aspiring portrait artist be? Um, a brand, uh, well, I would say make sure that your your work is good is is up to the standard that um, if you want representation, look at the artist that the means portraiting or portraits um, uh, New South portraits. There's a bunch of portraits going around, but look look at the work that's being done. Look at the portrait society in America because those are the people you're competing with. And um, if you're starting out, you have one advantage of charging money. So, and I think that's where you can get your foot in the door. If your work is pretty decent, you can charge a small fee, and you can basically think of it as getting paid to build your portfolio. And yeah. Make, make, even if, say, Say you get $1,000 for a portrait, or if you can do that, or, or less, whatever it is. Don't think of it as, uh, um, you know, this is a $1,000 portrait, so I need to put a little more of work into it. Put in $10,000 worth of work. Yeah. Because you have to make it really as, as good as you can. And it will be, you know, it'll be a learning curve, and you'll learn things, you know, you'll make mistakes along the way, but just if, if you are always aiming to keep the work excellent and always learning mm -hmm. and improving, then um, then you know you'll you'll get there eventually. You know, I think uh, honestly I think that's like the biggest nugget to leave. Um, and that was a great note to leave on for today, which is, you know, when you're first starting out, um, the I'm getting paid to practice idea is a really great way to look at it because right now the return on investment for at the very beginning of what you're doing is like nigh to nothing, but at least you're getting paid something, but to put your all into it, you know, because it's just, it takes a lot of jet fuel to get that, you know, that plane off the tarmac, you know, and, but once you're, up in the air things get better and uh, you start gaining momentum and everybody in every industry has to do that you know you have to kind of put in your dues uh, but the beautiful thing is is you can still get paid for it at the very beginning while you're still trying to build yourself up and um, start local start with like networking with family friends and just to build your portfolio I love that that was such a great bit of advice so, um, and then just, uh, it looks like one other person was just saying, Hey, from Norfolk and looking forward to the still life workshop. So it looks like they'll be joining us. Super excited about it. Grace, this has been awesome. Um,
deeply appreciate it. You can stay on after we, we close out or end the stream, but I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of everybody who's been able to watch today. And hopefully everyone was able to glean a lot of, uh, good insights just to, as a reiteration for everybody out there, the workshop is based off of, uh, called the organic still life. And she's going to be going over her process of how she paints her beautiful still lifes. Um, uh, mainly, uh, you know, like some of her cotton pieces that she's been doing lately are just so stunning. Um, it will be from May 24th to May 26th. And there will also be a painting from life that's free on YouTube that will be on June 3rd. So keep that date in your calendar. And then for all of our subscribers uh, who subscribe to our platform, it on May 17th, I will be doing an open critique night for everyone. So uh, Grace, thank you for your time. This has been lovely. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching. And I'm looking forward to work. Awesome. So Christopher just said, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're signing out for today. Have a great night and we'll, or a great day.